Welcome to another edition of RCE. Again, this is Brock Palin. Uh, you can find us online at rce-cast.com. You can find links, all the usual, Jeff's blog, my blog, our Twitter accounts, and all the usual social media things out there in the world. Uh, Jeff, once again, is here to help me out. Jeff, thanks again for your time. Hey, Brock. It's been a little while since we've been on. We took kind of a summer hiatus, but we're back. We've got a bunch of shows lined up, and uh, let's just jump right into this first one. Okay. So our guest today is uh, Steve Tiki um, from the University of Chicago. Uh, he's going to be talking to us about Globus Online. So Steve, why don't you take a moment to introduce yourself? Yeah, hi. Thanks. Uh, thanks for having me on. Um, yeah, so this is Steve Tiki. I'm with the uh, University of Chicago and Argonne National Laboratory. And I'm one of the leads of the Globus Project, which is really about providing software to help researchers get their research done. Okay. So um, we've actually had the Globus Toolkit on the uh, show before. Uh, we'll include links to that to kind of talk about what the Globus Toolkit software package is. So can you give us a little bit of an overview of what Globus Online is and what it aims to accomplish? Yeah, so maybe as a starting point, I can do that as a comparison even to Globus Toolkits, kits, and some of you may have familiarity with that. Um, you know, we had spent, starting in the mid-90s, uh, a lot of time building really plumbing software, Globus Toolkit, things for helping scientists move around big data, deal with their security information services, stuff like that. But we really focused at the plumbing layer and expected other groups like the high energy physicists or climatologists or other groups doing their big science to build their own custom solution over top of that underlying plumbing that we provided in the toolkit. Um, After I went off and spent a little time in industry and then came back to the university about five years ago, uh, Ian Foster and I, who's my partner in crime in all this, uh, decided that we really wanted to generalize what we were doing. So I'd take a lot of the lessons we had come out over the last decade and a half in helping scientists deal with big data, but produce tools that would be applicable to the rest of the science community, not just to the few big rarefied science communities. So that's really our focus with Globus Online, is taking a software as a service approach, you know, very, you know, things like Netflix, Gmail, sort of online web-based approaches for managing your big data transfer and sharing and longer term getting into richer and richer research data management functions for the nonprofit research community. Now, can you explain that a little bit more? Because, I mean, to me, when you say web-based transfer of terabytes worth of data, to me, that's like trying to upload a a video to YouTube and getting really annoyed because it fails halfway through. (laughs) Yeah. Because that's, that's in my mind, what the typical state of, you know, web-based transfer is. Clearly, you're talking about something different, though. Yeah, you know, I use the analogy a lot, right, that my seven-year-old son every day streams gigabytes of video to our house with Netflix, right? And why isn't it that easy for us as scientists to move our data around? You know, and if you think about some of the, the use cases, maybe that's even a place to start, right, is that, you know, as a, as a scientist, you know, I, there's data coming at us from all sorts of different directions. You know, maybe I'm using scientific instruments like next-gen sequencers or MRI machines or light sources or things like that. Or maybe I'm running simulations on an HPC cluster, so I need to, you know, I've got big output files of my simulation results, or I've got big data coming uh, that I want to do analytics on uh, from various you know, population sources and the such. You know, that's data that I need to deal with and get to the right places, right? Whether that's to my HPC processing cluster or to my cloud running in Amazon running Hadoop jobs or, you know, to my desktop or my server sitting in my closet in my lab, right? There's all these places I need my data, right? And, you know, as I sort of that analogy with my son and Netflix, it should be that easy for me as a scientist to get that data wherever I need it to be, right? And to be able to do that by just simply sort of point and click, you know, get to the various endpoint systems, say what I want to move from A to B. If there's failures, have that just taken care of, right? When when Netflix, you know, they've got their, their Simeon army that goes around killing servers and even whole data centers randomly to make sure their reliability works, you know, my son doesn't have to debug that when those things fail, right? And the same should be true for us, right? It, 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 that it should just work. We should, as the service provider, be taking care of that. 
with one big difference, of course, which is in this case, the data is sitting on your own storage systems, right? So we have to be able to orchestrate and manage these transfer and sharing activities between these existing systems, leveraging the high performance networks, all that sort of stuff, and act as an overall kind of mediator or manager of these activities so that you don't have to do that yourself. So you're using the name Globus for this, um, but like we had the Globus Toolkit on here before, which is the underlying, you could say, the heavyweight software part of this. And it, it actually does a lot of things besides just file transfer, and we're fo- but we're just focusing on file transfer right now. Why did you select to go with the name Globus? Why not just like wet grid FTP or something like that? Like why? Yeah, that's uh, artifacts of history, I suppose. Um, you know, we're back in... Would have been in 1995 when we fir- wrote the first uh, DARPA grant uh, for the software. There was we had a previous project that I was also a lead developer on called Nexus, and it was it was a communication library for clusters that we were starting to use in some interesting ways for more distributed environments. And so we, when we were writing that paper, I remember we put in a LaTeX macro for the name of the project and stuck in Globus as sort of the global version of Nexus and never really went back and changed it. So it kind of stuck. And then, you know, then when we started up Globus Online, it really was, you know, we had debated a lot. Do we keep the sort of Globus name at the heart of it or do we go off with some other whole new name? But I don't know, we like the name. It's a good generic name. And, and it kind of conveys helping scientists with distributed big data stuff. So... You know, that, that as much as anything is why we just kept with it and kept moving. And so we really then talk about Globus Toolkit as that plumbing layer toolkit that we and many others use. And then Globus Online as the software as a service that uses the toolkit but provides this real end-to-end experience for the users as software as a service. All right, now, what you outlined a couple of these already, but let's go a little deeper. You said what are some of the advantages over, say, a web-based upload, but let's go to something that's a little more robust than a web-based upload, like an, an SCP or an SFTP or you know the other traditional file sharing things that seem to work pretty well, or or even better, uh, you know, sneaker net. You know, if I just FedEx myself a couple of DVDs worth of of data, what's what's the advantage of what you're offering? Yeah, so that's good timing. So I just actually got off giving a webinar with the ESnet folks, who are uh, you know one of the national uh, high-speed research network providers for Department of Energy, and they actually had some great slides on this. I would definitely refer your your read your listeners, and you might you guys might even want to interview some of the ESnet folks in a future podcast. You know, they've got. They talk a lot about the networks and the high-speed networks, and they they had a great slide about exactly what you're asking, which is that, you know, we have networks now to campuses that are gigabit going to 10 gigabit, even 100 gigabit networks. And, you know, 10 years ago when we were only talking, you know, 10 to 50 megabit network sort of things, you know, schlepping around USB drives, shipping them FedEx was probably the fastest way, but they actually had, you know, showing the numbers of, you know, you, it's just not the fastest way anymore. And so they went through these various tools. So, for example, SCP, right, it was not designed for high-speed, high-latency networks like you hit when you're moving a lot of data around. It's It does well with sort of very local area environments and the, and the like. But, you know, they, they showed some experiments where, you know, on a 10-gig network, you know, they could only get about 150 megabit per second out of, out of SCP, it's just it's just not tuned for that. There's patches to SCP that allow you to do higher performance, maybe get up to the gigabit range. Uh, traditional tools like FTP, similar sort of things, we can get to the gigabit range, but they're not really tuned for lots of files and smaller files and exploiting parallel streams and all this sort of thing. So, you know, there's just this this whole set of tricks, I guess, as much as anything that we and many others in the community have developed out over the last couple of decades for how do you really move data at sustained rates of gigabits per second, even into tens of gigabits per second. And to first order Grid FTP as the underlying Globus Toolkit tool and Globus Online as a client to that, it, they, it just plays all these tricks. It knows all the games to play to tune your networks for parallelism and for buffer sizes and pipelining and all, all the things you need to do to make it work so that you really can sustain you know, gigabits to tens of gigabits per second on real transfers 
on real systems. So you've been talking about like making this easy to do uh, online and stuff. So was the transfer actually like happening through a web browser on the client end and there's a server that like an admin would install on the local cluster? Like how, like what's actually going on here? What's the actual interface look like? Yeah, the model that we've got is, um, I can actually use an analogy of Dropbox. Um, you know, and I'm a big Dropbox user for my little data, for my Word files and stuff like that, right? And the model there is I stick this agent on my laptop, which connects my laptop to the Dropbox cloud, right? And the analogy is very similar to what we do in Globus Online, is we have a set of products we call Globus Connect, which are really just fancy, easy installers around Grid FTP and a few of the other Globus Toolkit tools. But with Globus Connect, the idea is you take your storage system that you want to make available and manageable within the Globus Online universe, put this Globus Connect software on and it connects it to the Globus Online cloud, right? And we have versions of Globus Connect for everything from high performance servers. So, you know, if you have got a big parallel file system like a GPFS or Lustre on a high performance computer, supercomputer, you know, you can have a bunch of these that can sustain huge data rates. On the other end of the spectrum, we have versions that are designed to work on laptops, you know, sit on my Mac menu bar, operate in the background, work behind NATs and firewalls, right? With the Globus Connect tool, the whole point is, you know, get whatever storage system matters to you connected to the Globus Online cloud. So then Globus Online can do its thing. And so then as the user, once I've got the storage systems connected, I just log in via the browser. We also have a command line interface and REST APIs behind all this if you want to do that. But the typical mode is I just log in with the browser, connect to the two what we call endpoints, those two Globus connected storage systems, log in as necessary to each of them, provide, you know, because they may be in different security domains, and then point and click, you know, say transfer this folder or set of folders from one side to the other and walk away and it'll take care of it. I can come back at any point, check on it, and Globus Online will keep working. If there's failures, it'll retry, you know, all the sort of stuff there just to make it work. I see. So the web browser is not really the transfer agent. It's the command and control. And Correct. that's kind of a, a major difference between the scenario that I said before of uploading to YouTube and getting annoyed that it died in the middle. That's right. It's not an upload download to the browser, but really, you know, the very common case in our community is what we sort of call third party transfers, right? I mean, the data sitting on my lab server and I need to get it out to my HPC cluster or supercomputing center or Amazon, but I'm doing that all from my desktop or my laptop, right? So we're able to orchestrate from a third party location, from my browser, all of these data transfers and synchronizations. And I, you know, I've mentioned sharing very briefly. But also sharing, you know, not just transferring amongst my machines, but saying, here, Brock, I'm going to share this folder with my research data to you, and you can pull it down onto your systems just fine, all with the same mechanisms, all orchestrated, uh, you know, via the browser. So you you mentioned this kind of earlier, but I'm curious how it actually does it. So if I, if I use the Globus Toolkit directly, I can specify parallel TCP streams, Stripe transfers, uh, concurrent transfers if I'm moving a lot of small files. Um, but I notice that with the Globus Online, I don't have a lot of those options, but you alluded to that it knows all the tricks. Uh, yeah. How does it know it? Does it like run a test? Like how's it, how does it do this and understand that? Magic. Um it, it, it's basically, it, it's a set of heuristics that we've built up over the years that, you know, so for example, you know, there, there's a few main kind of tuning options that, that you can do within the, the sort of grid FTP Globus universe. You can talk about concurrency, that is how many simultaneous sessions of transfers are we running at a single time. You can talk about parallelism, which is between any two grid FTP servers, how many individual TCP streams are we keeping active at any given time? You know, about pipelining, you're sort of keeping the, the request flowing. So if you have lots of small files, you're not stalling out your TCP tree streams with all the control stuff, right? So there's things you can tune on all these axes and as well as a few others. And so we've, we've come up with some heuristics where we, you know, we look at the, the file sizes involved and, you know, where, where you're transferring to and to set these parameters based on, you know, just having done this too much over the years. You know, and it, we do, a, I'd say, the, the sort of 90% good job, right, for the typical scenarios of transferring, you know, within, 
either on campus or you know within say the the, the U.S. You know, our tuning will get you ninety percent or more of the way there than what you could do even if you knew what you were doing down to the mundane details. You know, there's some scenarios where like you get into really high latency or high loss networks where you might want to do a little more custom tuning and you can do a little bit without the command line interface, but the first order nobody does. Um, and that stuff over time will just keep improving those heuristics, you know, looking at, you know, what we're seeing to to keep sort of modulating these parameters as necessary to make it work well. Now, when I let's say I'm 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 random researcher and I have you know several terabytes of data at you know Brock's University, right, the University of Michigan, and I need to migrate them to some other institution. What's what's another institution that uses this? Uh, University of Chicago. There you go. University. Yep. I, I need to move them to University of Chicago to run them on on the machines over there. Yep. And I initiate a transfer. Does this mean I, I, I want to dive in a little bit about how this works? Here is was yep. where I'm going. Okay. Um, this means that both Brock and uh, sysadmin at University of Chicago needs to have some agents running um, between their file systems, right? And I'm effectively issuing commands to that, saying, "Hey, copy some of Jeff's files." from Michigan to Chicago. Is that how it works? That's right. Each of the two storage systems, the one in Michigan, one in Chicago, would be running one of the versions of Globus Connect. You know, there's desktop versions, there's server versions, you know, depending on, you know, who's installing and all that. But, you know, in this case, let's say, you know, you're using the server version, so the admins are installing what we call Globus Connect multi-user. And that installs the necessary software at the local system, both to allow you to log into the system or log Globus online to kind of log in as you temporarily to 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 you know you you know where you provide your password. Globus online gets sort of a short-term security ticket that it can use to interact with the system to do things, right? So basically, you log into both sides in that service, and then it's got the Grid FTP servers to talk to those local storage systems. And so then, Globus online, what it's doing is you know, when you, you know, it has functions for doing directory listings and stuff like that. So that's what you're using. It's going out to those good FTP servers to when you're doing the browsing to pick your files. And then when you fire up a transfer, you say, here's this folder that I want to transfer from A to B. You know, that basically starts a workflow of Globus Online talking to each of those good FTP servers at the two sites and just orchestrating the activities, right? So it'll do things like use the the directory listing functions in Grid FTP to walk your folder to figure out what files you have that need to be transferred. And maybe if you've turned on the, the synchronization options so that you only want to transfer files that's changed, it may, for example, do checksums on those files and then look on the destination directory and do directory listings and checksums there to see what's there and decide what it needs to transfer. And then it'll talk to both points and tell them, you guys set up a direct connection between yourselves and on the sending side, you send this file. On the receiving side, you, you receive the file and write it out locally. Right. So it's sort of orchestrating these sorts of workflows throughout. And I meant, you know, verification is a big feature. You know, there's um, you know a lot of history in our community and even a lot of various papers showing that things like TCP are not reliable from a from a um, bit reliability perspective, you know, so that bits can get corrupted in TCP undetected. And so we've built in extra levels of verification on the back end of your transfers. We'll reread your files, do checksums as necessary, just to make sure everything's working correctly. So it's really a sort of Globus Online managing this workflow of these two grid FTP servers at each end talking to each other and talking to Globus Online. Okay, now you mentioned something interesting there, the uh, the server version, multi-user version. Does that come with some kind of, you know, say policy support so that Brock can say, oh, I only want, you know, of all the transfers going on right now, I want, you know, a maximum of, of this many megabytes going upstream at a time and this many megabytes uh, going downstream and possibly even specifying specific network interfaces to use and all these kinds of things? Not yet. We actually just uh, we had written a proposal on that that didn't get funded. Maybe I should have found you earlier to uh, support that proposal. But um, <laughs> yeah, it was a bandwidth manager to do precisely what you said. Um, there are some ways that you can uh, modulate this depending on what you're trying to do. So one one thing a few sites have done, for example, is is uh, use like the the Linux kernel parameters where you can set 
you know, network sort of artificial network speeds on, on particular interfaces. If you want to sort of tune down a server, you know, we'll, we'll tend to use whatever you can give us at this point. The other thing that's happening a lot in, in our community is the science DMZs, you know, the stuff again out of the ESnet folks I mentioned earlier, where it's sort of a particular way of architecting your networks and research data environments on campus to make sure you really have the high bandwidth paths, but also that are protecting your other flows, right? So you're not squashing all of your other normal web traffic that your students around campus are using. So there's there's various techniques more at the network architecture level for doing that. Um, you know, we don't yet have the capabilities to say, you know, I want group A to get three quarters of my bandwidth and group B to get one quarter of my bandwidth. That's what we propose, but we don't yet have the funding to implement that. We'd love to at some point, though. Okay, so you had alluded to uh, sharing a little bit. Now, can you explain a little bit about what sharing inside Globus looks like? Yeah, the, the model in Globus Online with sharing, or maybe step back and start with the use case, is that... You know, for every researcher I know is using Dropbox, right? They're using it for the doc files and PowerPoints and, and the small stuff. And that, and that sort of centralized cloud synchronization model works pretty well for that small stuff, right? I can copy everything up to the Dropbox storage and synchronize it all to each of my machines. Wonderful for my day-to-day files. But that model falls over when you start talking about big data, terabyte data sets and the like, right? Because... You know, one, you're paying a lot of money for that cloud storage. Two, the performance to and from is not necessarily all that great. And three, I often don't even want all that data on all of my different machines, right? I, I Often when I start talking that scale of data, I want to be more selective about what I'm putting where and when and sort of the workflows around that. So what we've built with our sharing capability is, you know, our, our, our mantra there is, you know, file sharing, big file sharing and transfer with Dropbox-like simplicity from your own storage systems, right? And so the model is that as a user at a site that's turned on the ability to do sharing at a, at a Globus Connect endpoint, I can log into my normal file system, my normal endpoint um, as myself, but say, here's a folder that I want to share out to other users. And I give it a name, sort of think almost like a mount pointer, virtual name that I can just share with other users. And at that point, those other users can use that sort of virtual endpoint just like any other system they might use, any other place they can log into and do transfers from directly. But it, the, the key real feature of it is that, you know, if I'm sitting at University of Chicago, I have my data on the University of Chicago machine, but I want to share it to you, Brock, at University of Michigan, you don't need an account on my University of Chicago machine, right? Only I need the account there. By virtue of sort of exporting it, sharing it out to you, uh, Globus Online can take care of the security across the institutions for these sharing purposes. And then Globus Online can do fine-grained access control. So I can say, I want to give Brock access to these files read-write, but Jeff, I only want to give you read access to them or only give you certain folders and we also have even group capabilities, so I can say, I want to give rights to this whole group, my whole project team. And if I add a member to that group, they automatically get the access uh, that's been given to them on these shared file systems. Right? So we've tried to make the model really you know, as easy as Dropbox users expect for their little files, but make this work for the big files from your own storage systems. So what about uh, like read-only anonymous? Uh, yeah, it, we have... Um, Read only. I'll be careful. I'm going to be a little pedantic. Um, we have read only to all users, all Globus Online logged in users. We don't have un- uh, reading sharing yet for unauthenticated users. That's on the plan. We just have not yet uh, finished this off. The sharing functionality is in beta testing at the moment. So it's relatively new and we have lots of great ideas for where we want to take this, including that one. So do you see yourself having Globus Online be a universal uh, scientific identity manager clearinghouse, um, kind of similar to almost like some of the stuff that in common or CI logon are doing. Uh, sort of. I'll, I'll, so the the work that you know, for example, in common in terms of providing 
sort of basic cap basic infrastructure where I, as a University of Chicago employee, can use my University of Chicago login to log into various services. We have support for that in Globus Online. We can leverage that very well so that we can actually provide you know, single sign-on using my campus University of Chicago ID into Globus Online and back out to University of Chicago resources. Right? That's a standard feature in what we do. But we've also built up all sorts of great capabilities. I mean, if you think about, you know, fundamentally what we've done, right? We've created this nice web application that plays really well with research infrastructure and security domains and in commons and all this sort of stuff so that we could use that to build transfer and sharing. But what we realized some while back was that everything we were doing there, eh, maybe others could get use from that and that maybe we should make that available as platform as a service as well. So we've actually now got a few other groups, for example, the K-Base project out of the Department of Energy. It's a systems biology uh, project building a web application, software as a service for that particular science community, is leveraging our platform, all of the, the Globus identities and the ability to do federated identity with income and groups and all of that for their application. So all those same groups you use for sharing in Globus, you can use for... Uh, you know, for access control in KBase, right? And so this is part of our strategy. So it's not really to replace those systems as much as provide the tools that make it very easy for other groups who want to create their own web applications for this community to leverage all this rather than have them have to reinvent all this stuff themselves like we had to. Okay, now, uh, taking a, a slightly different direction here, um, and someone going back earlier in the conversation, uh, you mentioned Globus Toolkit, and we've talked a lot about Globus Online. So Globus Toolkit is uh, open source, right? And, and you can just get that and, and do whatever you want with it. But Globus Online is uh, a service. What is the relationship between these two? How do these work together? What is the differences? What are the commonalities? Yeah, so Globus Toolkit, as you say, it's open source. You know, it's Apache license, you know, pretty typical open source project. You can do whatever you want with. Um, Globus Online, you know, we, we made a conscious decision to say that the, the software as a service, the part that we run at the University of Chicago, that it's not open source, that this is something that we're keeping. And there's a variety of reasons for this, ranging from that, you know, if, if one of the lessons I learned in my stint out in the commercial world was that the whole software as a service development and delivery model is very different and has different efficiencies to it than traditional, you know, like open source software development. And so, for example, you know, by not actually distributing our server side software, I probably am saving 30 percent of my development costs because I'm not making it work in different environments and porting it places and trying to make it so that other administrators other than our own people can can actually install and use it. So there are actually a lot of efficiencies on the creation of the software itself. And so the result of that is I'm able to create a, give a lot more functionality in Globus Online by, by doing it as software as a service with us being the only ones who actually operate it and use it. Other reasons is that we also, you know, we've been in this game a long time and recognize there's this big problem in the, the research world around sustainability. You know, there's been lots of hand-wringing around that term of sustainability in our world for a number of years now. And so one of the things we are actually doing with Globus Online is starting to introduce some of the capabilities like the sharing as an actual paid service, you know, as what looks to the user a lot like commercial software as a service. Now we're doing this as a nonprofit from the University of Chicago for the nonprofit research community, but we're doing this so that we'll be around 10 years from now still providing better and better capabilities. And so, you know, part of the strategy is that, you know, the, the software as a service is something that we're creating, we're owning, and we're providing, uh, you know, for payment to the community, and that's what partly sustains us. So essentially our model is that the, the software as a service that we run, you know, is ours, but all the Globus Connect bits, all the pieces that you would install out on the periphery that would connect to that, that's all open source and part of the Globus Toolkit, including all the Globus Connect pieces. All right. Now, another question kind of tying into that but going back to how does this work here. On the, the homepage for globusonline.org, which 
I amusingly note has a picture of Brock right on the front page. Um, <laughs> there is also a counter in the You're top. You're a poster right. child, Brock. That, bro, you really are a poster child. Um, th- there's a counter in the top right here that says how many megabytes have transferred, and I, I can't wrap my brain around it. Is that exabytes? How many bytes is that? It's, about, it's twenty, like almost twenty-one petabytes at this point. Mm-hmm. Only twenty, almost twenty-one petabytes. Yeah, okay, so, great. so that would be now. What, where the, yeah. are you getting that number from? Because a lot of these transfers are going site to site, and they're not going through the University of Chicago. So, I mean, are you? Sending these kind of statistics. I'm just curious as to how that number is assembled, I guess. Yeah. So remember, these, these numbers are only for transfers using Globus Online, not all GridFTP servers out there that may be using other clients, right? Because there's, there's a lot of GridFT, GridFTP servers out there, for example, in the high-energy physics community that are using other clients, whether they've developed them or some command line clients that are in Globus Toolkit, to do transfers. And actually, on that, we're seeing about a petabyte a day of traffic based on, on we, we have sort of this anonymous uh, usage collector, uh, usage logs that come back from grid FTP servers that turn it on. And so it's actually probably more than that because we know a lot of people don't turn it on. So that's at the grid FTP level. At the Globus Online level and what you're seeing on our homepage, remember that's all requests coming through Globus Online, through the Globus Online service where we're mediating all of that, right? We know... You know, there's this file of this size being transferred from site A to site B. We don't see the data itself, but we're because we're managing it, we we know what's being transferred around by Globus Online, and then that that number is actually just a query against our database that's within like 30 for 30 cents, 30 seconds accurate. Okay, so you, you've touched on a couple of things there, and so I want to clarify a little bit, like. If you want to try this out, what can you get for free, and what do you get if you pay? Yep. So what you get for free is you can do as many transfers as you want, as many synchronization. The sharing is really the first feature for which you're doing paying. So so you can create your own endpoints. You can put your laptops on. Admins can put your servers on, right? All of that's free. Getting your systems connected, doing transfers amongst those systems, That all that is and will remain free for the nonprofit community. Um, as you know, as, if you want to start sharing, right? If you want to create what we call these shared endpoints, you know, take some data, from my endpoint and shared out to you, I you need to have what's called our plus subscription. That's our sort of our, our subscription plan that gives you access to some of these additional capabilities. And we'll be adding other features to that plus subscription over time. And so that's the that what you need. And that's the one that's the you, know, you can either get for seven dollars a month or seventy bucks a year and we'll have credit card processing in literally in a few weeks here for that. And then we also have versions that campuses can purchase that you get a bundle of plus subscriptions you can give out to whoever you want, as well as getting some management tools. So you can sort of manage and see all the transfers happening to and from your endpoints, your Globus Connect servers um, via Globus Online and see what's happening. If there's issues, you can see all that, suspend, resume, all that kind of stuff. Okay, so to clarify a little bit, that $7, that's for the Globus Online user. So me as an admin, I install this software. I can enable, disable whether I'm going to allow sharing on my machine, but I don't have to pay anything. I can just install the software. And then the user using it can pay the 7 bucks. Or me representing the University of Michigan can go and get this site license, basically. And then all my users can get it. Yep, you got it. And that, that's on purpose, you know, because we recognize some of the campuses and, and even some of the more get down to individual research groups you know, they're they just want to get up something up and going, and they may not need the sharing. You know, and they're, so the transfer is sufficient. So we've purposely come up with this model where you, you know you can get going for free, and you can do a lot of stuff for free. But you know, there's you know as you start moving up into some of the more advanced functionality, we have ways for the, the sort of different parties within our community, end users and or campuses, to to pay for that advanced functionality. Now, one of the hot button topics today is uh, social. So, are you going to be integrating social services in here, like um, Facebook logins and Facebook likes of certain files and things like that? 
Uh, we, we actually. Have I, I'm totally the kidding. Debate. There is no answer to this question. That was a well, joke. No, we should I, we probably just edit debates. it straight out. <laughs> yeah, we have some of those over beer, but actually, we do allow login using Google Open ID today. So we don't really have, yeah. okay. Yeah. So you can. Right, you well, I was kidding, but that that's actually nice. <laughs> yep, and we have considered Facebook, but we haven't had the demand for that one with Globus Online yet. As you probably know, right in our in the research and university community. There's actually a lot of universities starting to integrate more closely with Google and Google Apps and stuff like that. And so that was actually, there was um, real demand for, for that capability. Okay. Well, if you ever add Facebook liking for individual files, then you have jumped a shark. <laughs> uh, so what's coming for the, the future of Globus Online? So we, we've talked about a couple things that are, are, are coming up. You've mentioned incidentally, but what are some of your other bigger plans that you can talk about? Well, I mean, we're, we're still in sort of late beta testing on the sharing functionality. So we've got our hands more than full just getting this out the door. And we've got a huge laundry list of stuff we can do to improve, you know, little features around that. So, you know, certainly you'll see for the next 6 to 12 months, most of our activity will be just happening around making that service better and better and easier and easier, you know, with the features for the users. But beyond that, I mean, there's a few big things. You know, for example, we're, um, you know, we're getting a lot of interest from campuses in in Amazon Web Services and being able to transfer files to to S3 into Glacier, stuff like that. Whether it's for long-term archive in a service like Glacier or to get my data up into S3 so that I can use, you know, burst processing in EC2. Uh, whether it's you know. Work, uh, high performance computing or Hadoop type jobs. Right? So we're getting a fair amount of demand for that. So we're starting actually some of the design activities around what would it look like to do really high quality integration of Globus Online, sort of native deep integration with S3 um, so that sort of all the stuff, you know, you know, the transfer sync sharing, all the you know, verification, everything that we do just works uh, with that sort of environment. Um, Longer term, we're also really starting to look hard at sort of the next layer up the stack, right? We're, today, it's about files, right? It's about transferring your files, synchronizing your files, sharing your files. But of course, there's a lot of other research data behind besides files. And so, you know, our, our real overall mission is not file transfer, it's research data management. And, uh, you know, across all of that data, across the life cycle of the data, so we're, we're starting to do a number of pilots with various groups right now to start getting into the whole metadata arena. So I can start tagging my files, searching for things, sharing both of the files and the metadata, you know, really you know, having a way to capture more and more of that research data and be able to manage it and share it through its life cycle. So a, a random question and... and this might sound like I'm continuing the Facebook joke, but I'm not. Do you offer – what kind of notification do you offer? Because the whole point of this is to transfer very large things that assumedly take some time, right? you got to start the transfer and then go off and do some other things. Then, oh, okay, now the transfer is finished and I can actually do the research that I'm trying to do. How do you notify people this? Like can I get a, a push notification on my phone? Not currently. Actually, we were just uh, discussing that one last week. Also, that's we're right now. What I get is a, you can get an email notification of completion or of certain fault conditions that you may need to respond to. For example, maybe you need to reauthenticate, relog into a particular system to allow the transfer to continue right where it sort of left off. Um, we're actually, you know, I mentioned the long backlog of items uh, or to do list to do. That's one of them is to get to, to allow these multi-channel um, mechanisms for notification, whether it's email, text, text, mes text messages, as you say, push notifications to you know, iOS or Android apps. Um, even we've talked about things like instant messenger. So I, I can, could send a notification to my Gtalk, um, or I guess it's now Hangouts um, account. So that, that's it's definitely something that's on our roadmap. Um, at some point here. Okay, so something we like to ask people is, uh, what's the most unusual or strangest use you've ever seen um, Globus Online used for? <laughs> uh, 
strange, I don't know what, I suppose strange, strange as compared to some of the research stuff. I guess one I would, you know, a couple maybe I'd point at. Um, one that was sort of a funny one was back at Globus World um, in April, which is our annual conference. Um, we were having a bunch of the sessions videotaped. And right after I did my part of the um, the, the keynote where I showed off all the, the sharing functionality at the break after that, the, the fellow who was videotaping everything came up to me afterwards and said, do I understand this right, that I could use this to allow me to get my these videos I'm doing out to my customers? <laughs> yes, why, yes, you could. Um, so we're, we're seeing you know things like that. And we've also seen actually some interest even interestingly in the, the film industry of you know, groups that need to transfer uh, movies and stuff like that around within particular industries. Um, so, you know, we're, we're getting some of those so sort of more commercial and use cases that we certainly hadn't thought of when we were building this showing up. I'm not sure if they quite qualify as strange, but they're certainly not what we expected. Okay, well, Steve, thank you very much for your time. Uh, where can we find more information on Globus Online and get started using it? Yeah, just go to www.globusonline.org and you'll see there lots of information. Sign in, sign up. Uh, go give it a try. Okay, Steve, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for your time.